Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future in Review podcast, where we talk with leaders in tech, science, and business about the future of technology and its impact on society and the global economy. I'm your host, Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. And I'm here today with John Bean, who is the CEO of Mem Computing, and Fab- Fabio Lorenzo Traversa, who is the co founder and CTO of Mem Computing both of whom are joining us at Future in Review in Los Angeles at just a few, in just a few weeks to talk more about MEM computing. But John, Fabio, welcome. It's so great to have you here with us. You as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're talking today because of a special demo that you did using your technology, um, MEM computing, and how that demonstrated the potential to break 2048 encryption technologies in less than a second. Um, for those who are watching this, this podcast who don't know anything about encryption, can you explain to them why that is important? What is the so what of this, of this demo that we're about to talk about? So I'll, I'll jump in quick here, Fabio. So our, the internet uses something called RSA 2048 to uh, as encryption for the keys. So it has a public and private key that it exchanges. And the private key uh, is one that we don't know about, right? So it, so to in order to break encryption, so you could break into the internet or, or communications or what have you, you would have to be able to crack that private key. The way the private key is made up of two large prime numbers. And uh, the, the way that you could break the key is called prime factorization. Basically, you, you identify the, the two prime numbers. Now, with current technology, it's expected to take 400 trillion years to break this. So that's why it's considered extremely safe. However, uh, you know, there are different means that are trying to go after and, uh, and break that. Quantum computing hopes to do it one day. But with mem computing, uh, a new technology, new compute architecture that was invented by Dr. Traversa here at UC San Diego, uh, we demonstrated that we can, uh, at scale, we can actually break the RSA 2048 in uh, um, in subsecond time. Now that's we're not at the scale today, but it's just about you know two years away that we would we'd be able to do that with with funding. <laughs> right, right, right. So Fabio, can you tell me more, a little bit more about mem computing? What is it? How does it work? And what is it about that architecture that allowed you to make this kind of breakthrough where others have not been able to? Sure. Uh, so normal architectures for computing are our computers, right? They, um, their building blocks are a gate. Uh, they are called logic gates uh, and they work uh, essentially in a sequential fashion. So you give inputs and they return outputs. So our uh, uh, new uh, uh, computing architecture instead is, uh, um, is based on a, a different concept of gates. We call them self-organizing gates. So those new gates, instead of being uh, uh, sequential uh, type of object, so input output, they are uh, they have these terminals that are input output agnostic. It means that they can actually support the superposition of signals that carry input and output information. And uh, uh, they work like reorganizing their voltages. So you can build a network of those gates and you literally embed problems onto them and uh, and solve problems using uh, the, the the physics of those gates so this reorganization of voltages is actually the physics of the gates so their dynamics and so we use exactly this principle to solve problems so instead of using an algorithm implemented on these logic gates that we have today in, in computers we take the problems and we embed on on uh, this new uh, uh, architecture uh, that is self-organizing and use the physics instead of the algorithm to solve problems. And so the result is higher output? Uh, the result is that uh, especially for problems that are uh, classified as combinatorial problems, uh, mm -hmm. which means that you have to explore all possible combinations to find the right one, uh, 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 usually with a computer, the algorithmic approach is exactly that. So checking all possible combinations and finding uh, the correct one. Now, instead, if you use mem computing and you use this physics uh, that uh, solves the problem instead of the algorithm, what happens is that you don't check all combinations anymore, but the physics uh, uh, naturally goes into the right one. Now, 
this is clearly much more complex uh, than what I just said, but uh, more or less gives you the idea. So you skip this process of uh, checking all combinations, Every but, uh, combination, exactly, yeah, yeah. but instead you, you leverage the physics to go exactly into the combination in that, uh, uh, that, that you need to solve your problem or is the solution of your problem. Now, this is a technology that you have personally been working on for quite a long time. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. We introduced the uh, uh, self-organizing gate. So we introduced this concept of mem computing in 2013, 14, self-organizing gates uh, in 2015. And so, yeah, it's almost 10 years uh, uh, that we are developing this. And at what point did you realize that it might have this capability or this level of, of you know, so, encryption or de-encryption? Well, we always kind of knew, and the reason is very simple. Uh, I have to admit that we were uh, um, like, uh, um, uh, initially what we, we were thinking is, okay, we, you have a quantum computer and you use the Shor algorithm to solve uh, the factorization uh, and it leverages uh, uh, this, uh, this way of uh, uh, having, you know, the entanglement. And many people talk about this entanglement. Entanglement is exactly uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, correlation between uh, the qubits that you leverage. You are leveraging physics to perform computation. So our thing was, okay, let's leverage classical physics to do the same. And our first goal actually was, okay, if you le we leverage classical physics to do, can we really factorize? So since the beginning, actually, we were thinking about uh, 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 these uh, problems related to cryptography, but we never really worked on this. Uh, actively because once we started uh, uh, like developing, we saw that uh, uh, it actually can be applied to many more different problems much quicker and easier in an easier way. Like for example, scheduling, uh, uh, planning, all these very uh, hard combinatorial problems, but that they are very important for industry. And, and so we started applying to these these other uh, these other aspects. It was the low hanging fruit, if you want. So how, when, when you were, you, were you, did you discover this on purpose? Sounds like yes, or? Yes, it's, it's been a, a, a pretty long process. Okay. Uh, uh, so the goal was, uh, was uh, so we started uh, with the in-memory computing, which is a, a more, uh, um, it's a broader concept. Uh, our first article was where, for example, on, on uh, what we call the dynamic computing random access memory, which is a, a RAM that can perform mm -hmm. some logic. We started doing these things. So it, it was very basic. We were not thinking about combinatorial problems. We were thinking just to start having a computational memories. So memories that could perform uh, some certain type of computation, possibly basic computation, but still some computation. From there, we started like defining, uh, uh, and when I say we, because I did all this part of the work uh, together with uh, Max Diventro, who is a professor at UCSD, and we, we developed this together. And uh, uh, it was the, um, we, we, we started defining uh, a, a much more abstract concept, which is uh, the universal mem computing machine, which is basically the, a, a co the computational model that describes uh, a computational memory. Okay, and from there we discovered, okay, so you have now this abstract model, what are the properties? Because usually mathematicians do this. No, you, mm -hmm. you, have, you, have, uh, you have several definition axioms, if you want, that describe a, a theory, a theory, and from there, then you say, okay, I have all of this, what I can do with this? And you start writing theorems and blah, blah, blah. And so we realized, okay, wow, the computational memory in its most ideal form it's actually so powerful that it's equivalent to something that is called a non-deterministic Turing machine. But in practice means that it can solve very efficiently combinatorial problems that otherwise require exponential resources with a normal computer. So that was all theory at that point, mm -hmm. complete theory. Like we don't even know how to realize this in practice. It was like, okay, we have some mathematical theorem that tells us this, but, but, but how we actually do. And so from there, then we started thinking, okay, how we realize this concept in practice, and we came out with the, with the self-organizing gates, which is a, uh, a embodiment of, uh, of the uh, universal mem computing machine. And so John, what, at what point did you, did you join mem computing and, and come in on this process? So I was a entrepreneur in residence at UC San Diego. I've done a few startups. They asked me to join them 
and evaluate their IP and to look for something to spin out. And when I was there, I met with uh, Dr. Fabio Traversa and Dr. Max Deventra, and they presented the technology to me. And it was very clear to me that the capabilities were uh, something that, you know, I didn't want to see sit on a shelf, right? We needed to take this out and try to commercialize it. And, uh, and yeah, we all agreed with that. And the, the university, um, you know, blessed us spinning it out and we've been working at it ever since. And when you think about the potential for, so as the CEO, you I would imagine you're more focused on the business side of things. When you think about the potential for this technology, I know, you know, this is a very exciting discovery that you've made. Um, and frankly, kind of terrifying if you're worried about your ability to encrypt anything online or have any kind of pr private conversation or transaction. Um, but are there other, do you see MAM computing pursuing this and following this path? Or do you see, you know, this is a thing that maybe you've done and, and you spin off and continue on with MEM in some other capacity? Or how are you thinking about this from a, from a business well, perspective? To drop back for a second, MEM computing is a new computer architecture. And mm -hmm. we're really a deep tech company. Everything is about the circuit development using the MEM computing based technology. So we've actually uh, patented quite a few different chips in the long run. We see ourselves like an arm. We'll license, we'll do the design, we'll evaluate, you know, build the chips and design the chips, but then ultimately we'll license them and other people will build them themselves, right? So Got it. And, but now stepping back, there, are, uh, when we went out in 2019, we've been solving these, uh, these um, routing scheduling type problems for large companies, BP, Lockheed Martin, Chevron, uh, also for Air Force, Space Force, and NASA. So a huge... The, you know, huge comp uh, uh, comp complex computational problems that they can't solve optimally today that we can solve for them in a minute. So, uh, um, the so could you give could you give an example of like what type of problem would you would you would fit in that category? So the types of problems uh, are the easiest one for everybody to understand is think of the UPS trucks, FedEx trucks, Amazon trucks. An individual truck has to do about 120 deliveries a day to generate an optimal route. So they generate routes. They obviously are delivering packages. They generate routes, but to generate an optimal route would take them years and years and years of computer time. That's something that we can do in minutes. And we've done for some of these other companies. So it's a, uh, the, the, the problem is considered intractable. And, and the advantage is now, if you think about it, uh, in fact, this from, from UPS's own marketing, if they could save one mile per vehicle, per truck, per day for a year, it's $50 million, right? So, so, and what we've shown to the companies we work for and done projects for is that we're demonstrating that they can save tens of millions of dollars on an annual basis because we can give them an optimal solution versus an approximation. Right. So, but for the, for specifically for the prime factorization from the beginning, we have, have intended it for use by the U S government and for control by the U S government because of, what you noted is that it's pretty frightening what it, the implications that it could mean if it got on the outside. So it's not our intention to complete it on our own and go after a market uh, necessarily. We, we'd really rather uh, see this in the hands of the U.S. government and, and let them control it. So this is a, I mean, as you've just alluded, this is, this is a, a, a big deal, right? It's a, it, it is a big deal. And the level of funding that you would need to complete and time that you would need to complete this is not significant in the grand scale of things. Not at all. You know, if you compare us to quantum computing, so we're actually delivering today, sorry, a little bit of a commercial, but we're delivering the performance that quantum computing hopes to deliver. Quantum computing hopes to break, to do prime factorization. But they're at least 10 years out. And, and frankly, they've been 10 years out for the last 30 years. So, but, but the government puts hundreds of millions of dollars into quantum computing on an annual basis. Worldwide, billions of dollars on an annual basis go into quantum computing. So there's thousands of, of scientists, work, phys physicists like Fabio and, and Max working on this, and they've been doing it for decades. We've been doing this for five, six years commercially, 
and uh, uh, with seven people and and with very little money. And and so anyway, the 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 short answer is that it would be a fraction of what they put into quantum today. They, it's a rounding error in what they would need to invest in us to get us to take it to the rest the rest of the way. And why is like why are you allowed to talk to me about this right now if that's the case? Well, it wasn't our choice. So we've we had requested. So we we did this work with the government. We actually did it, uh, it under the guise of a working with an Air Force intelligence group, and we had always been telling them and other government officials that we work with that we think that this should go top secret and go black, and they should you know control it. And uh, and so we actually we had this capability back in December of last year and, and haven't publicized it because we didn't want to. Um, and then ultimately a so but we were we were um, you know sharing it socializing it within government agencies and we're right. talking to everybody and anybody we can talk to. And so it happens that one of the government agencies who invited us to talk to them, give them a presentation and demo, made the presentation and the demo live public it was public so they forced our hand which in some ways is good because now we're getting some recognition for the things that we do greater recognition but um it's still there's you know the issue with what this ultimately means and how it should be handled so you at the moment are basically seeking government funding to kind of like retract this information and this this just not retract it but to to re maybe move it back into like a little bit more of an obscure situation where it can be completed, finalized, used. Yeah, that would be our preferred method. Uh, we are also talking to larger space organizations because they may have one, they have, they possibly have the funding, they have, have deep pockets, but they also have the relationships with the government. So they might be able to help us take it the rest of the way and with their credibility and their contacts. So I'm curious, you know, this is, I think people often think of government funding as like, there's so much of it and it's very advanced. In your opinion, how is it that this uh, demo has been able to, to slip through the cracks in this way from a security perspective? And, and maybe I guess a better question is how, like, who would you be looking to, who do you think is the natural entity to fund and advance this kind of work? Like, who would you like to connect with? Well, ultimately, I think this belongs in an intelligence agency, right? So uh, NSA, CIA are the obvious ones to, to man it and control it and uh, figure out what they want to do with it. Because um, it has huge national security implications. And the, the, the strategic benefit that the United States would have uh, over their adversaries they haven't had since World War II. That's what this delivers. But the, I think the challenge is just that we're out of the mainstream. We're a small company out of San Diego. And, you know, it, it, it came from UC San Diego. It didn't come from Stanford or MIT. Mm. And we just, uh, we just haven't gained the awareness and haven't gotten to the right desk yet for somebody to recognize that this is something they should try to pull in. Well, we hope that uh, by bringing you to, f to future interview in just a few weeks um, and, and by introducing you to some of the kind of f folks at, at that conference, we can help you make those connections. Um, are there things that you would want to say? I mean, this is a public podcast. Are, is, are there things that you would want to say to the general public about this technology or about thinking about encryption that this has kind of surfaced? Uh, just, you know, it, it sounds scary uh, and it is scary that ultimately it could be developed, but but we aren't able to do it today. So nobody is is cracking your Amazon account or your bank account or anything like that. Um, and ultimately, again, that's that's why we think that this is something that should be in the hands of the government um, rather than us. We don't. But I'd rather, I'd personally not like to have the responsibility. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot. It's, it's a big weight to have on your shoulders, right? Absolutely. Having, all yeah. right. Well, thank you both very much for your time. I look forward to spending some time together in person in, in LA in just a couple of Absolutely. weeks. And um, thank you for all of the work that you've been doing. It's, it's a really 
extremely important. And I, I very much appreciate what, what it is that you're trying to do. Thank you. And thank you for inviting you. us to the conference. We're, we're excited. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Should be great. <laughs> yeah, we'll be. <laughs> yeah.